Well, it's great to be sitting here with you, Matthew. Yeah, it's good to see you, Maurice. Uh, nice to see you again after Pebble. I was interested in, in what you're doing immediately, but your background is so varied, and it seems like everything's kind of gelling at this point. Mm -hmm. All the stuff that you've done your whole career is kind of coalescing into new projects, which we are going to talk about today. But um, what, what would you call yourself? What, what, tell us about your background. If I were to call myself anything, it'd be an industrial designer. Uh, but I've also, you know, over the past 12 years, been involved in both, you know, well, 20 years for automotive design and about 15 years for uh, feature film concept art and also television as well. And you've designed all sorts of vehicles, yes. whether they're land, sea, and air, right? Yes, exactly. What are some of your favorites? Let's see. Uh, well, my first television show project uh, designed, rebodied a 442, which was pretty cool for a TV show for ABC called The Prince of Motor City. That was uh, an interpretation of Hamlet, but applied towards uh, the sort of uh, dynasty in the 2008 era when you know everybody was losing their shirt uh, in automotive production. And so <laughs> that one never aired, but it was a cool prototype. Yeah. And so that was my first experience going through an actual build out with a uh, television show or a film. So that was really something that's kind of near and dear to my heart. By the way, was that car kind of retro futuristic or? Yes, it was supposed to be uh, the uh, Hamilton, uh, you know, car family. It was a, uh, you know, car a car company named after the family and this particular muscle car was supposed to have been designed in the same era of, as you know the general era of muscle cars i guess you could say so i'd say maybe mid 70s early 70s cool um, i designed a tank for uh gi joe retaliation with the rock and bruce willis and uh, they didn't help me design it but they were in the film and uh <laughs> and that wasn't just like on paper, no, they, they built, built the it. darn thing. They built it, and they yeah. had like uh, functioning Gatling guns that fired blanks, and uh, it was <laughs> it was uh, really quite quite a quite a prototype. So that was pretty exciting. Um, as an intern, I was at Mazda, and I got to work on the uh, Mazda Furi, which was uh, one of their, I'd say probably the most interesting concept vehicle of the first decade of the 21st century. That was really a beautiful car, and uh, you know I was really happy to have been able to like pack clay on the full size model. I was working on early interior development, some of the lighting concepts, things like that. So that was really a special, a special one. You're also an art center grad, right? That's right. Tell me about art center. It's a fascinating place, and the alumni list is a mile long. Yes, uh, luminaries, right? Yes, uh, yeah. Art Center is um, a very famous school in Pasadena. It originally was in downtown Los Angeles, and Effectively, they were responsible for years for about 90 to 95% of uh, designers operating in the automotive industry. Thereabouts, the estimates are, are somewhat loose, but I think that's what I was told when I was signing up to go there back in 2005. So we're talking about people like, for example, Larry Shinoda, sure. who designed yeah. the Mako Shark No, the Corvettes, yeah. Right. yeah. I love that guy's work. Yep. Yeah, I love that guy's work. And then, of course, Freeman Thomas. Yep, Freeman Thomas. Chris Bangle. Mm -hmm. Those guys are yeah, fantastic. I mean, Ken Okiyama. Uh, oh yeah, Shiro Nakamura. Pretty much every head of design, apart from the guys who went through CCS or the you know uh, RCA, Royal College of Art. Those were the three, the three big ones at the time. I mean, it's actually proliferated quite a bit in terms of availability of automotive education. But how heavy is that influence ultimately when when they're on the job and they're making decisions and they're in charge? Absolutely. Um, if you look at automotive design and how it's matriculated, I'd say especially in the past forty years since the eighties in particular. The studios have become increasingly more international, um, and I think that you could see examples like that would have been, uh, you know, Ghia Studio in Italy from Ford, and uh, so there was like a lot of crossover that was going on starting back then, and even before, to be honest. But it's it's only become more so, and so if you go into any studio globally, whether it be Volkswagen's Advanced Studio in Potsdam, or if you were to go to any of the studios in Southern California, of which there's you know a dozen, uh, you're always going to have a highly international group. And the student body, traditionally at Art Center, or even at RCA or Pratt for that matter, or uh, maybe CCS to a lesser extent, is hyper international to begin with. And so the main issue, though, becomes, um, I think, from an educational standpoint at least, because I do teach at Art Center from time to time, is that you start to see a, a bit of uh, stylistic redundancy in what I kind of call the blase international style, where things kind of start to blend in. It's not like uh, I guess you could say in the 60s or, or 70s where you would see a vehicle and you would say, well, that's probably a French car. Or if you saw a Swedish vehicle, you'd say, well, that's, a, that's definitely a Swedish car. There was something that you could detect, some sort of je ne sais quoi that's sort of lost with the, um, I don't, for lack of a better term, the globalization of design language. You know? Right. 
And also that's about economic realities, right? And also regulatory totally. burdens. So the whole, I guess, I don't know if this is even the proper terminology, but the whole platforming mm -hmm. concept where, you know, we're, we're not, the cars are not really that individual under the skin anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, and I think that also has a lot to do with the fact that, let's say, BMW puts out their new 7 Series. I guarantee you the first thing, the first customer is probably going to be Mercedes buying it and field stripping it in the studio. Right. And taking apart all the technology and reverse engineering everything, and that goes uh, for design as well. Uh, I remember Chris Bangle gave a presentation when he was still the uh, head of BMW design, and it was <laughs> it was a comparison of uh, the 7 Series to the S-Class, and he was just swapping out the grills and then all of the insignia and then by the end of the you know ten or twelve step maneuver, you could they were indistinguishable from one another. And uh, I think that that's that's that exists for a couple of reasons. And like you mentioned, I mean the platform component, uh, the high level of cost, the amortization of the tooling. It's around a, roughly a billion dollars to make a production car, and so there's a lot on the table. So they're going to be doing everything they can to uh, scrutinize what the competitor is doing. But it's also a trifecta of balances within the design complex, which is between marketing, engineering, and design. And those are kind of the three pillars that are constantly struggling for influence. And I think that uh, marketing has come to dominate quite a bit. Um, but some companies, of course, you would say that they're more of an engineering company or more engineering you know, specific. You mentioned the cost of bringing a car to market, a billion dollars. Do you think that in, inhibits risk taking, creativity? Do you think that that is one reason things are homogenous? I, I think so. I mean, that's that's for production vehicles, meaning that you're going to have right. a, I don't know what the exact number cap would be, but I would say probably in excess of 10,000 units a year, um, maybe more. If you're looking at limited builds, you have a lot more flexibility. And so once you, let's say that you were to build a one off vehicle, and you're looking anywhere from 1.5 to 3 million cost, I would say, including whatever your overhead is for design development. Now, if you start to move into a production paradigm where you're dealing with not just uh, making everything hand-built necessarily, but you're using soft tooling upwards of 20 units, then you start to amortize your vehicle costs. So it will go to 1.5, then it'll go to 800K, and it'll, it'll gradually amortize that, that uh, cost of production. Now, what the ceiling is for that, I guess you would probably need to make upwards of 100 units or above in order to start really turning a, a distinguishable profit of some sort, but that's all dependent on supply chain costs and everything else, and you know who's available. <laughs> right, and that's your objective ultimately, right? With a, uh, I would say, an ultra limited production car of yes. your own design. Yes, Matthew, who who were your design influences, your your heroes, um, whether it's in school or even today? Well, I would say certainly uh, you've got certain people that are highly influential when you're when you're studying industrial design, and that would be everyone going all the way back to let's say Norman Belgetes or Raymond Lowy, mm -hmm. uh, who were very much universal in their uh, apprehension of the subject. They didn't they didn't consider themselves to be just a, a one trick pony, and I think that kind of lineage also moved um, you know from Raymond Lowy to people like Sid Mead, and uh, Sid worked with Raymond, and uh, so there's a bit of that continuity there where you see uh, the type of work that Sid was doing where it went from everywhere from automotive to product design to you know more fantastic things and really kind of uh, moved between industrial design and feature film concept design. And so that's, I think that's somebody that everybody really sort of looks up to considerably. Right. Um, and, that's, and his influence is unquestionable. Um, now, in, in terms of moving into uh, automotive design, like I mentioned Ken Okiyama already, I was really... Uh, when I was moving into automotive design specifically, I was really kind of enthralled by the Enzo that he did and um, or had part <laughs> part of something to do with at least. Right. And, uh, you know, so that was always very cool. But I'd, I'd say ultimately um, what you really learn from are your peers. And when you're in the studio, when you're working together as a group or uh, individually in some sort of uh, subtle form of competition but collaboration, that's really where uh, you learn the most. You mentioned Sid Mead. Tell me about your friendship with him. Absolutely, yeah. Sid was, uh, you know, he's a luminary in the design industry, and uh, every everybody who's an industrial designer or car designer or in feature film industry, they everybody knows who he is. Blade Runner, Tron, so many different yes. amazing 
amazing uh, motion pictures. Yes, and an Art Center alumni. And so while I was at school there uh, working on the BMW project for uh, the Chris Bengel sponsored project, um, <laughs> somebody said that, uh, oh yeah, they just had gone over to his house. And I was like, wait a minute, this guy lives in Pasadena. And uh, they said, yeah, well, I just looked him up in the phone book and uh, gave him a call. And he said, oh yeah, sure, come on over, show us your work. I thought that sounded too good to be true, but I, I looked him up in the phone book, gave him a call, and uh, Roger Cervix, Sid's partner for quite some time, mentioned that I uh, could come by and show some work, and, uh, which I did, and we uh, you know, stayed in touch and ran into each other, like I'd said, at uh, many of the different functions at Art Center, like the Car Classic events and things like that, and so it's really just one of the benefits of being, uh, being a student there at the time, is just running into you know, luminaries like that. Yeah, amazing. Um, and are you a big film buff? Mm, somewhat, I guess, sort of. It depends. Depends. I mean, working in the industry, one would think that they go together, but not necessarily. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate good film, but I'm also, I'm not like a Quentin Tarantino that's going to, you know, <laughs> sit in the uh, screening room for right. <laughs> and days on end. You're not a cinephile. Not necessarily. Right. But I like, I appreciate good film, but mostly for me, it's it's about design. And let's talk about the difference between designing for motion pictures mm-hmm. versus designing for the real world. Certainly. Because things on screen don't have to necessarily work, mm-hmm. but they do in the real world, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it depends. It's, um, it's interesting because with, I kind of look at it as uh, constellations of constraint systems. It's kind of how I describe it to my students where um, let's say that you're building a production automobile versus a concept car. There's different constraints involved because obviously, uh, as you mentioned earlier, there are different kind of legal requirements if you've got a vehicle that's going to be slated to be interacting on the freeway or, or public roads uh, versus what would be a one-off car, which may uh, be considered uh, something of an exhibition vehicle that would have different types of regulations related to it, as well as mileage caps in terms of how many miles you could drive it annually and things like that. So um, moving into <laughs> feature film concept design, sometimes uh, you'll have a build-out where you're, you're dealing with, let's say, a donor chassis of some sort, and you're going to make a picture car, as they call it in the industry, where you're just going to be rebodying some form of an existing uh, chassis. But that also happens in coach building and automotive as well. So there's a little bit of crossover there. Right. The main difference is that in film, the vehicle has to perform for the camera and for the ultimate uh, you know, visualization, which unless it's a James Cameron project, it's probably not in 3D. Right. And uh, it's going to be a flat graphic on a screen. And oftentimes, they'll build out, you know, they'll build out a couple of the cars or the picture vehicles, or they'll build a partial, and they'll do a VFX shoot, um, or they'll just make it VFX altogether, or they'll have all three. And so sometimes you're dealing with multiple versions of the same product. Did you ever spend any time on set during uh, any of your motion picture work? Uh, a little bit on uh, Space Jam 2, oh, actually, wow. at Warner Brothers. And uh, <laughs> where I got to, I did this illustration for a set of, uh, they were doing a lot of vignettes in all the Warner Brothers properties. And one of them was Game of Thrones. And so LeBron was uh, dressed up in, you know, armor, sitting on the, uh, you know, the throne made out of swords. Right. And uh, so that was kind of cool. And it's always kind of nice popping around Warner Brothers and looking and seeing what they're filming there. Um, I was just at a set. Uh, what they're calling virtual production, and it's the technique they're using for all of the Star Wars TV shows right now, like The Mandalorian, and uh, it's essentially like an LED uh, enclosure cyclorama volume that they're able to, uh, using Unreal Engine, track a uh, camera to, so that they're able to dynamically light the scene and the actors and everything, and they can change it all in real time. It's amazing. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, it's, that, that was really kind of mind-blowing. You know, I would imagine that it, it gives you a little bit more context as a designer. Mm-hmm. Um, it ultimately m- maybe has no bearing on the work you're, you're doing in, in, for Hollywood. But mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I really enjoy when you're on a project, like I mentioned Warner Brothers. Uh, Warner Brothers is a great company to work with. They've got a beautiful lot over in Burbank. It's very famous. Uh, you know, everybody knows the water tower. Everybody knows the logo from at least the, you know, the Bugs Bunny cartoons and whatnot. And uh, it's really a very kind of fun experience just to be there working on set if you're on an art department that's embedded there because you get to walk around and you can go have lunch on a stoop of the New York set or you can walk around and figure out who's working on what other productions and maybe you'll see Conan O'Brien 
walking around when he's like eight feet tall. Well, with the hair, he might even be nine feet tall. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) By the way, do you have advice for young people who are interested in going in in some of the same directions that you have? I would say just jump in with both feet. Um, Try to pay attention to your personal uh, inside voice kind of guiding you along the way. And there's no substitute for taste. So anything you can do to cultivate uh, your own personal taste and understand history, understand context, understand development of form over time, uh, those are kind of important things. But ultimately, um, you should enjoy what you do. Matthew, is it hard as a designer to be original, to to not let other designs influence you, whether subconsciously or, or otherwise? I think that there's a balance. Uh, we're all um, cultural entities in a sense, and so we all speak a common language. We have common fashion senses in some, some way, shape, or form. Uh, we have certain things which are available to us based on the era in which we live, and therefore things are constantly influencing us. Um, I think that the best way to cultivate an original approach or a unique, a unique approach is to change your methodology. So if you're trying to solve a problem, if, you, if you're constantly using the same tools to do it with the same frame of mind, uh, you're going to end up with similar results. Now, there's a gradation between uh, subtle influence and overt, uh, I would say, plagiarism which there's a balancing act. But I think that if people are more marketing dominated in their frame of mind, then they're going to emulate as much as possible. If they're uh, thinking about it in terms of uh, being uh, an artist, they're going to approach it as individualistically as they think that they can within reason uh, because they still ultimately, uh, it is a commercial field and you do have to have a uh, commercial viability to the work that you're producing. Otherwise, it would just be fine art. Uh, That's kind of the difference between design and art. And you can't be too risk averse, therefore, right? I mean, you, in, by definition, in order to take chances and break new ground, yep. you have to be willing to take some risks. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm the type of designer where, I mean, I'm always willing to jump out of the airplane and catch the parachute on the way down. So <laughs> I don't really have any risk aversion, which is, has served me well, but it's also, it's also created some friction at points, obviously, because if you're dealing with uh, organizations that have a very specific way of doing things and you can come off as a bit cavalier. Um, I think I've learned how to mitigate that a bit uh, now that I'm 20 years in. Right. Uh, But it's always a risk. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. All of these things are kind of coalescing for you as a designer, but also as a hopeful in the manufacturing space, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, so presently what we're doing, or my group is doing, uh, we have a company called Y0. Uh, and it's, uh, we're starting as an NFT project, but that's really just the, the base layer of what we're doing. Uh, I guess the, the formation of it really started back in 2010, where I was working on a thesis project when I was gradu- doing my postgraduate work at Art Center. And the idea was to uh, develop an ecological manufacturing solution that is based on locally distributed build-outs um, of a vehicle without having to have a uh, massive global supply chain where you're shipping everything over, you know, you're, you're mining the iron ore, you're shipping it to another country where they're, they're rolling it, and then you're shipping that rolled steel out somewhere else where they're stamping it, and then they're shipping that somewhere else where they're assembling it. It was really looking at how do we uh, create these types of uh, micro uh, production environments that could, let's just say, be in LA County, and maybe you're bringing in modular components that you don't necessarily manufacture there, but you're, you're trying to do everything as locally as possible. So that was the, the manufacturing component of the project. Uh, the historical alignment was naturally, um, Briggs Cunningham was a very famous uh, car builder as well as race car driver at Le Mans. Um, you and know, by the way, no relation to you. We're both from the Ohio River Valley, so I'd have to see the family tree. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, because I believe he's from Cincinnati. Well, and I suppose if you go back far enough, you're probably 21st cousins. If you go back a thousand years, you yeah. know, we all, we're all from Ayrshire in Scotland. So, right. um, but, you know, his projects were quite interesting in the 50s. You know, he started off racing other vehicles and then he eventually got into producing his own, which he then fielded at Le Mans. Uh, but not, not just race cars. The guy was into boating as well. I believe he won the America's Cup. He did. And he actually invented something as it relates to rigging or sailing called the Cunningham. Uh, but I really wanted to do something that was sort of a, an homage to uh, what, what Briggs had done with his cars, uh, La Monstra, which was a highly aerodynamic. Uh, it was designed by uh, aerodynamicists, I believe, from Northrop Grumman. 
who did the body work on that car, which the French called Le Monstre, because it just looks to them like something completely alien. It's a slab-sided behemoth. Yeah. 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 And it's a Cadillac. <laughs> yes, and, you know, full wheel covers, and it, it just looked like uh, like some form of, some something completely unique, I guess you could say. Yeah. And uh, after that, they started producing other vehicles like the C4R, mm-hmm. which I thought was, you know, a very interesting vehicle. And uh, Briggs actually invented the racing stripes. So they're actually, if you look them up, they're called the Cunningham stripes in Wikipedia. That's right. And uh, Shelby later picked that up. Um, and, you know, because from what I understood, the international uh, regulations as it had to do with racing is that each country had to have its own color. And it just happened that the Americans uh, were white. And Briggs felt like they needed some other sort of visual cue, and he added the racing stripes and I believe what is the you know telltale blue. So that was always kind of uh, kind of compelling. And then the connection to Shelby, I thought, was really interesting as well, and that whole sort of thing. So it, it really, that was that was kind of the uh, archetypal American race car tradition, if you were to point your finger at any kind of lineage. So it seemed like a natural project to leave the uh, school system with. So. Um, That was a historical component. Uh, The manufacturing component, I was really focusing on using materials that would be sustainable as much as possible, as well as modular drivetrain components so that you wouldn't be, uh, you could almost be powertrain agnostic uh, if you wanted to be. So I designed the uh, aluminum space frame to be sort of like a cubic cubic space frame with uh, aluminum extrusions that you could pull out different structural members to allow for different volumetric displacement internally as needed. Um, But ultimately, you would be looking at a kind of like Cartesian cubic grid of potentiality as it relates to load-bearing members. Uh, So that was the uh, structural component. But one of the things I really wanted to focus on was uh, biocomposites and bioresins. So if you're doing a low yield of production and you're essentially emulating the fiberglass body construction process, uh, only using sustainable materials, you know, the, the holy grail would be you know, getting a new a new part and just pulling off your quarter panel, putting it through your mulcher and putting it into your tomato garden or something like that. It's kind <laughs> of the idea. And uh, w- but at the time, this is back in 2010, I was designing the vehicle for entry into the market in 2020. And so a lot of this was uh, speculative in terms of what would we be able to do. Um, the web-based purchasing model was another big component of it, which kind of foretold a bit of what's called Web3 technology now, where we would be using different types of algorithms to interpret aesthetic uh, decisions uh, based off of what I was kind of designing as um, different archetypal modalities of thinking about design. So if you had a different value system, I kind of extracted it from something that's called spiral dynamics, then there would be interpretive data that was kind of integrated into the design process that would then pair you with uh, whoever was in the stable of designers that we had available for the project to develop spe- you know, specified uh, vehicle designs based off of that kind of data that was collected. So that is a very high concept. Yeah, and it was kind of hard to pitch this too when you're in a car design school and they're like, <laughs> most of them are trying to figure out which studio you're wanting to go work for. And so a lot of people were just going to be designing like, if I want to work for Ford, I'll do a Ford. If I want to work for Mazda, I'll do a Mazda. To, to get that kind of lightning rod attention from the studio. But, but I, it, it, Matthew, it's interesting, this concept, because everything is moving more and more towards greater personalization. Mm-hmm. And even the car manufacturers now, all the OEMs are talking about different features in the car that you're going to be able to sort of buy on a um, sort of a cafeteria menu, mm-hmm. different amenities and features inside a car. Mm-hmm. And, and by the way, I think the, the real direction that, that that is going is the ownership model of cars is starting to fade or they want it to fade. Mm-hmm. They want us to all share. Mm-hmm. So if you're sharing a car, you're not necessarily sharing the same features in it and amenities. Mm-hmm. Mostly from what I know from being in the school and teaching is that the younger generation, most of them are not really that interested in driving. And I think that that's simply because they have the technology available for ride sharing. And if it weren't for that tech, it wouldn't really be uh, an option per se. Um, now, if you look at the applications of that from a commercial standpoint, and you're going to have what BMW or Mercedes is going to just produce a fleet of vehicles that are going to be on call, and you have a timeshare model, um, they'll absorb all the maintenance costs. How much is that going to cost you? Is the average cost of ownership going to be higher than private automobile ownership? That's something that people haven't really discussed. Um, who's going to pay for it in the end? 
And then, as you mentioned, the level of customization, which is simultaneously being elevated, it's almost like you're going to have a, a complete separation of the two, almost like a time machine, Eloy and Mor- <laughs> what is it, Morlocks? Yeah, the Eloys and the, and the Morlocks. Yeah, yeah, you're going to have a separation where you've got people who are just, they just want the mass market consumption stuff. And then maybe, maybe AR is going to be the way that they reskin it, maybe mm-hmm. through uh, those types of um, low cost uh, modifications or, or basic lighting. You know, you can could, you could do a lot with lighting even. So if they have like a specified uh, RFID, Bluetooth signal lighting scheme that they prefer when they get in the vehicle and everything changes and it puts on their favorite song and, you know, whatever those kind of parameters are, um, I think that that might be something that would be tenable there. On the private side, though, I don't think private demand for the automobile is going to diminish entirely, almost like, and I wouldn't even compare it to to horses or the equestrian groups because I think that obviously there's a... (laughs) Having a car has a lot more appeal than necessarily having a horse because a horse is a lot more maintenance. See, I always say this. The, the automobile is the ultimate expression of our personal freedom mm-hmm. in the modern world. Absolutely. You know, and I, I'm with you. I don't see it going. I don't see the demand going away. Mm-hmm. I see regulatory uh, implications and government's hating on the car Mm -hmm. like they have for many many years Mm -hmm. by the way it was something that bill mitchell of general motors was famous for commenting on uh, about how much the government wanted to be rid of cars Mm -hmm. to to government it's it seems just like a a big problem rather than the how we view it as car guys right where we're passionate about it and even if you're not necessarily a, a car person it's transportation to you and very little else you still want to exercise that freedom. Absolutely. You know. But getting back to your design, now you talked about how the chassis can be customized mm-hmm. based on powertrain and layout and all that, but that's true for the body as well, right? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And and so like what are your plans in terms of layout, appearance, uh, use case, that sure. kind of stuff? Absolutely. So the uh, the concept was initially uh, put forward so that you could have a single type of uh, frame construction methodology with this, you know, three different lengths of aluminum extrusion members with a connector node, and then you could kind of build out whatever volume of vehicle that you needed. And then uh, in this particular instance, we were looking at the C4R and the Monster as the main uh, aesthetic influences, which is why it has that sort of constructivist uh, appearance, which this kind of this kind of drove some of my uh, instructors at Art Center a bit crazy uh, because there's, there's, there's this perception in automotive design that you have to do something which has what they call an automotive look, you know? Yeah. But I was looking at it more from I wanted the aesthetic to resemble the, the build process in and of itself. So I wanted it to have it a, constructed, a, a constructed appearance, I guess you could say. Uh, but like I said, it's all modifiable. Um, if, if the uh, body construction is independent of whatever the uh, frame component is, then all you have to worry about really is your, your hard points where you're bonding it to the, to, the, to the frame. And then obviously glass is always a bane issue. So curved glass, uh, difficult, <laughs> difficult right. to produce. Um, so you would have to probably pick what your carryover parts would be, but then you would have quite a lot of freedom to design something new on top of it. See, I like this constructivist approach. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Why is it okay for motorcycles to have exposed mechanicals and frame? We like that. Mm -hmm. We like it less when that's all hidden away behind bodywork. And Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, the most famous example of this is um, the Vincent motorcycle. They built a motorcycle in the late 50s, uh, I I think starting around 1955 or 56, that was completely enclosed. And it didn't really sell very well because it reminded people of a motor scooter. Oh, okay. But another example would be uh, the Ducati Monster, yep. which is very constructivist, mm-hmm. and, and that's a huge hit, And in addition to being an amazing motorcycle. And then the other example I think of is the Lotus and other Grand Prix cars from the late 60s. Mm-hmm. They had minimal bodywork, and I like seeing chassis. I like seeing gearboxes hanging out the back end. Mm-hmm. That's super cool. So I like your constructivist approach. I think a lot of it has to do with the way the modern cars are built and that if you strip off the body panels and you're looking looking at the body in white, it's really not that aesthetically pleasing. 
Right. And, uh, you know, just imagine when you've seen somebody with their front fascia pulled off their car and you're, and it just doesn't have, uh, it's not as, there's not as much attention put to the beauty of the assemblage as there is to the way that they're skinning it. And mm-hmm. so I think with uh, motorcycle design, there is that attention. There is that attentiveness to it, like with the Ducati Monster and the exposed red frame and uh, all of that. I mean, it's, they pay the attention to each level of it and made sure that it was dialed in from an aesthetic as well as a performative standpoint, which is the only way to really be successful with a constructivist approach because you have to count on there being additional material added and additional material being taken away, and yet the theme is still consistently retained. Right. So this is a very ambitious project. I mean, I don't think anybody would argue with that. We even talked about how expensive it is, a mm-hmm. billion dollars for a production car, but mm-hmm. you're not looking at a mass production market. You're looking at a very specific, tailored, let's say micro production market, right? Sure, of course. Yeah, um, so it's it's kind of interesting. I, I think that the way this whole thing got started is that um, my company was like a top 10 finalist in the LA Automobility Challenge back in 2017. Uh, and we were up there with uh, Honda and Herman Miller were, I think, on the other top 10. They were there as well, so we felt pretty good about it. Cunningham Concept Design was uh, up there with them. That's in good company. It, definitely. And I got approached by Rob Report, and uh, Rob Report uh, gave me a call, and they said, oh, we want to feature some of your vehicle design work from this particular project. And I said, okay, um, you know, here's my website address, mrcid.com. Maybe go check it out and see if there's something else that you'd like to feature specifically. And they, they noticed the Cunningham Car Project. Uh, the syntax, and they said, oh, this is what we want to feature. And I said, great, um, because it's getting closer to 2020, and that's when we were slating to to try to get this car out anyway. So the aesthetics uh, of what's acceptable and the zeitgeist of modern taste is finally catching up to it. Uh, and so they ran the story in Rob Report, and they ran it in Rob Report Singapore as well. And I started to get um, interest from a software company that I know in San Diego, I guess, earlier this year, now it's 2022, and they uh, wanted to put together an NFT project, which was all the rage. And so NFTs, I mean, I didn't really understand anything about it because to me it just seemed like, okay, people are printing out JPEGs of pictures of, of apes with hats on them and you know, the sunglasses <laughs> and, they're, and they're selling these in secondary markets, and it made absolutely no sense to me. Uh, but I also knew that understanding a little bit about the digital technology, that if you're able to attach metadata meaning any kind of written informational content to uh, a graphic or a 3D model, that that has gigantic implications from a, uh, not only an authentication standpoint, but also for different types of uh, proof of ownership and chain of custody. Almost like uh, if you're buying a used car, you want to see how many previous owners you had. Like this type of chain of custody of, uh, you know, personalized objects I thought was pretty unique. So I thought, that's great. Why don't we use it as a way to potentially crowdfund a physical build out? And so what we'll do is we'll move from this fictional world and try to alchemically transmute that into a physical car. And let's just see if we can put it together and, and do that. And so that was really the idea is to take that project of, uh, you know, the Cunningham inspired car and to use the NFT platform as a way to crowdfund, uh, generate interest as a bit of a lightning rod. Uh, but at the same time, it start to coalesce uh, different corporate you know, partnerships together. And so uh, with the project, we've been able to set up uh, partnerships with uh, some very high level build partners, potentially like Aria Group, as well as Icona Group. Icona uh, is, you know, they're essentially Bertoni or they acquired all of Bertoni's assets and they have production in Yokohama Bay and outside of Tokyo, as well as Torino, and they have uh, some building capacity here with Civax in Southern California as well. And we've also started to put together uh, via partnerships with my colleague Priscilla, who's in charge of that, um, with groups like Nine Fiber, who specialize in uh, hemp fiber extraction. And so putting these build partners together and R&D research groups together, we've actually developed uh, or pulled our first uh, part of a hemp body panel uh, awesome composite. So I'm pretty pumped about that. We did that a few weeks ago, and we're going to use that as a way to generate interest in uh, revenue as well. So the NFT market can do whatever it's going to do in the crypto market. I'm not. I'm not a particular. Uh, you know, I'm particularly over invested in in either of those realities per se. But I do look at them as unique market opportunities for 
uh, especially car companies, to go into in order to generate interest in their product. Almost like the modern version of the poster of the Countach mm -hmm. is a metaphor that I was using. And I saw that creep. Somebody else, I think, got that from one of my presentations earlier this year and started circulating that same metaphor. But I think it's a good one. Uh, where everybody's access to a product is kind of granular and hierarchical in terms of the amount of revenue they put into it. So if you're a teenager in the 80s, you had a poster of the Countach on your wall, you may have never actually seen one. Uh, next step, maybe you see one at the auto show. Maybe the next step is that you actually sit in it, and then beyond that, you take one for a test drive. Then maybe you own one. And after that, that's kind of, I guess, the pinnacle. Or maybe you join a Countach car club and then maybe you're at the reunion at Pebble Beach and you show up with 100 other Countaches like happened, to, uh, not this year, but last year. And then so there's this, there's this gradation of experiences that are possible. Uh, and I just think that with the NFT, AR, VR component, uh, that's a huge one where you'll be able to have a, a limited uh, engagement with the product via either uh, an AR or a VR context which is simple. What we have to do is furnish the 3D model and all you have to do is have a phone and you'll be able to see it in real time. Uh, and apart from that, we can use whatever fundraising we allocate from the NFT project to move into a prototype build, which over a six to eight month period with a donor chassis, we could probably build out a, a show car for about 1.5 to 3 million, somewhere in between. And if we were to approach funding of upward of 15 to 20 million, we could build about 15 units at a sticker of 1.5. And so those are kind of the numbers that we've been looking at. But the way that we're approaching it from a uh, community standpoint is the NFT is sort of like a token gate, as they call it in the business, where it's almost like your key card that will get you into all these additional experiences, which may be everything from model updates. Uh, the thing that we're really pushing is a VR um, pipeline where the customer or the team member or community member will be able to participate in the actual one-to-one -one build out uh, process that we'll be conducting in VR with programs like Gravity Sketch and Autodesk Red for photoreal immersion. And uh, that's kind of where the technology sort of folds into the potentiality for the physical build out. And I think that's something that's really exciting. Interesting. So if I decide I want an NFT, does that then uh, get me in the door for the actual physical car later on down the road? Yes, you would, you would have access to, you would have priority, I guess you would say, in terms of uh, buying the product. But because of the nature of NFTs as it relates to, uh, is it a security, is it not a security? This is the, like the debate that's going on dramatically at the moment. And so what we're doing is uh, the NFT portion of the company, we're simply selling a digital collectible. So that digital collectible will potentially give you access to uh, experiences. Uh, but the digital collectible is ultimately what's being purchased, which is uh, you know an image as well as a 3D model that you'll have the rights to in perpetuity. And there's only a limited edition of them, so we're not going to produce them. Or And you'll have your authentication as it relates to that, that this is the official product. Uh, By the way, Matthew, mm -hmm. just in case anyone has been living under a rock for the last three years, uh -huh. an NFT is a non-fungible token. That's right. And so, it, as you say, it's a digital collectible. It's unique artwork. Mm -hmm. It has a digital signature, again, like a fingerprint, like we talked about. With It's on the blockchain. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so the advantage of that is that it simply is a way of, um, I, use, I use an example of, let's say, uh, premium fashion goods, like handbags. Okay. So there are the official luxury handbags, and then there's also a massive counterfeit market of fake luxury handbags. Now... There is always a distinction between the two, and people will always prefer to have the genuine, genuine article. Now, there's always going to be uh, instances where data is either illegally scraped or replicated, or much as we were discussing with AI and MidJourney, where they're taking people's uh, copyrighted material and they're proliferating it in a way that is unethical. Um, as it relates to NFTs, you have assurances that what you're doing is something that is actually tied into uh, something an artist produced, and it's authentic and it's verifiable as such. Uh, so I would say that even if uh, a lot of the arguments that you'll hear are like, well, why would I, why would I purchase that if uh, I could just go and, and grab the JPEG offline? It's like, well, because you're not just getting the JPEG, you're getting something that's saying that it's authentic. So if you want to go buy the counterfeit Gucci bag, go right ahead. You know, <laughs> have a great time. But you can also go to the store and you can buy the real one. The counterfeit market isn't going to in any way diminish uh, ultimately what the luxury goods market is going to do. I believe what it, if, if you were to make that argument and say, well, I could just go scrape that JPEG, 
all you're really doing is you're, you're, you're adding more value to the real product because that just means that it's that desirable that people are you know, ripping it off. I think also some of the resistance or skepticism about NFTs is simply a generational thing. Uh, a lot of people don't understand why younger f- people have an affinity for digital stuff, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but they do. They're mm-hmm. very excited about digital stuff. I mean, all you have to do is look at streaming mm-hmm. and video game play mm-hmm. where it's really an interactive thing. And, and some of these streamers are making millions of dollars as influencers. Absolutely. So that digital space is incredibly significant for the future. And, and NFTs is just one aspect of that. Exactly. And it's just a component. And it's also just a small segment of our general business model. Um, as you mentioned, the component as it relates to the digital uh, asset, right? That is something that's very interesting to younger people that are digital natives. You know, your, your Gen Z, your Gen Y, even Gen X uh, to a certain extent. That digital they, natives, that's a good, I've, I haven't heard that term, but that, that describes it perfectly. Yeah, so to them, um, they may see a digital asset as having more versatility and use than the physical asset because you don't have maintenance costs affiliated with a digital asset. And their application or use case scenario may be they're living more so in the digital context than in a physical context. And if everybody's on their phone <laughs> instead of driving, they're more they're probably more inclined to have uh, some sort of weight attached to that digital asset that perhaps uh, you know older generations may not necessarily understand or appreciate. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Uh, concurrently, though, uh, Gen Z and uh, Gen Y are the largest emerging uh, private automobile collector. Uh, target market demographic. So they're the ones who are growing the fastest in the private automobile collection space. So my prediction is simply that there's going to be quite a lot of crossover there and that it, it's, you know, it's, it's very easy to be dismissive and not to say that most people are, but I've seen some people be very dismissive of the notion of, well, why do I want this digital product or why would I want this anyway? But that is an, it's almost like buying the DVD of a film. I mean, that is essentially a digital product. You're not, um, you're not wrapping yourself in all of the film footage itself. It's just it's just contained on the small disc, and you're able to appreciate this immersive world. Everybody can relate to film, and I think it's only a matter of time before these types of digital assets are kind of uh, proliferated and uh, utilized in that kind of commercial space in much the same way. What's the next step for the company? Sure. Uh, so Y0 uh, is the name of the company, and we're launching our first NFT offering. The NFT is a very much an entry level. Uh, we're going to be start looking more at partnerships with, let's say, video game companies as well to introduce the asset. Uh, the vehicle that we've developed is in com- uh, collaboration with Craig Lieberman, who was the advisor for the first two Fast and Furious films. So those are his cars in those two movies. And so I've been working closely with Craig, developing uh, body kit and livery uh, designs that we would be incorporating into the physical build out. So once we see what kind of response we're able to generate from the NFT offering, we're going to be moving more towards seeking either VC or other types of equity investment to move into a build program, which we've already had designed with Icona Group, uh, which would be uh, either a six to eight month build out for a show car or an 18 to 24 month build out for a limited run of, let's say, anywhere between 10 to 20 units. How about powertrain? Powertrain. Uh, initially, the vehicle was conceived of having, you know, in, you know, in-wheel electric motors. But due to unsprung mass, we wouldn't be doing that because that would be problematic. Uh, so the, the, we'll have electric motors. Uh, we're looking at that as the as the main drivetrain. Uh, but like I said, the vehicle was designed to be somewhat powertrain agnostic. So the notion would be that we could alter that. Um, I was a big proponent of electrical uh, way back in, like I'd say, 2008, 2009. But I never really saw it as a cure-all for uh, you know, what type of uh, powertrain solution you might want to have for a vehicle because obviously uh, petroleum has its advantages. Electrical has its advantages. Uh, most of our electrical power is derived from coal and nuclear tech anyway. So to think that you're going to solve the world's problems by just going electric, you're also not looking at raw material extraction as it relates to all the different types of metals that are necessary and rare earth materials in general. So there has to be this kind of balance to it. But ultimately, I was really interested in electric simply from the foot, you know, foot pounds of torque and what you could get away with on a quarter mile with one of these things. And so that was what I was always kind of uh, intrigued by. So we're going to start with electric for sure. But we're, uh, we're, open. we're open to seeing how powertrains evolve. Well, I can't wait to see how this comes together. It's, it's definitely exciting. You're a fascinating guy. 
I learned a lot today, so thanks for having us. Hey, thanks, Maurice. It's great to see you, and I uh, hope to see you at Pebble again next year. Absolutely. I'll be there.